Hi, everybody. International Master David Proust here. And today we're going to um, be looking at another game, which I think uh, you should have a good shot at being able to memorize pretty smoothly. Um, this is a game that I myself uh, memorized some five or six months ago when, as part of my chess recovery program, I was trying to uh, memorize some games again because... I realized I'd forgotten a lot of the games that I had in my head, and I thought, well, let's just let's just give it a whirl, you know. Um, I'm not a beginner anymore, but uh, I could still learn something by putting some good games in my head and just carrying around a little bit more more chess there. So I was I started looking at some miniatures at first, like I've suggested to you guys to do. Um, start with shorter games. Um, I started looking at some miniatures at first, largely because I enjoy miniatures. Um, I like you know short exciting fun tactical games but um but uh you know then i was also just looking for like random famous games that i didn't know right like when someone asks you have you read war and peace and you're like oh no i haven't read that right but it would be great if you knew like some of the classics because then you could talk to other people about um what they've also what they also know about and you also recognize what they're talking about so a good example is that morphe opera game right like the most memorized chess game in history and the most well-known chess game in history, right? So um, if you're talking to another chess player and you want to make a reference to the opera game by Morphe, the chances that they'll understand what you're talking about are extremely high, right? So I haven't shown you guys the game and I can just say like, you know how Morphe sacrifices the rook on D1 on D7 in order to bring the H1 rook into play one move faster? That's like a great example of using reserves in an attack. And chances are that you can like understand my point. I don't have to like go through the game to show it to you. Um, okay. So yeah, so I was trying to fill in on some of the chess classics. So I was like just looking up like games of Kasparovs and Kramniks and Fishers and stuff like that. Um, and uh, this is a game that I'd never seen before. And immediately I was like, wow, this is like a fantastic game. And what I think is like helpful with this game for you to be able to memorize it is it has a pretty long string of um, sort of like tactical and forcing moves where there's like not, where it's like harder to go wrong. Um, I don't have the game with me, so hopefully I still remember it after all this time. If not, I'm gonna have to embarrassingly like run over to um, somewhere in my house and find like a book that has this game in it or um, or I'll have to like go look it up on the internet and, and find it for you. Um, so stay tuned and find out if, if I get really embarrassed here. Um, yeah, so, uh, we're going to go through this, um, Kramnik Kasparov game, Kasparov Kramnik, Kasparov's going to be white. And, uh, hopefully, uh, you guys can, uh, memorize this one yourselves. Uh, when I first played through this game, I thought that it was a really nice, clean example of an attack. Uh, but then when I looked at it a little bit more, I finally realized that, uh, you know, there were more defensive options than, than anyone took advantage of, um, than we're actually taking advantage of. So as often as the case, um, clear... I don't know the move order here. Um, as often as the case like clear wins are not that clear um, with some more analysis. You often find resources for the defender. So I don't actually know the move order of the first couple moves um, because I don't even care about that move order. I know that they reach this position here, right? This to me, it's like an opening from my repertoire, but you guys should also, you know, potentially know that this opening exists. Um, the semi-slav defense is uh, defending the queen's gambit by defending with both your c6 and e6 pawns. And one of the main variations of it is something called the Moran, invented by Akiba Rubinstein, as far as I know, um, where black surprisingly gives up the center in order to fight back with this quick thrust of the b pawn. And using the b pawn kind of harasses these white pieces and then usually try to st strike back really quickly with c5, although there are some other options as well to how black can play it. but. Um, but yeah, what I, what I remember 
is not the exact move order, but I remember what opening is played in this game. So I know that it's a Moran, and I know that it's a bishop to b7 Moran. Here, another uh, principal variation is a6. That's what I myself played for years, kind of like an old standard Moran like this. Okay, uh, how do I get back since that didn't actually happen? Okay, bishop d3. I just don't have that much room to adjust if things go wrong. All right, um, so I know it's a bishop b7 Moran. And I remember that here, instead of playing e4, white spends an extra move castling. Black then plays a6, and now e4 gets played. So now, basically, we have the Moran variation that I used to play with bishop b7 and castles thrown in. And black is always going to counterattack with c5 uh, at this point, and white plays d5. So, um, yeah, I mean, I also know that, in general, white's strategy in these kind of positions... Um, is always going to be that when black plays c5 or e5, you're often looking for a chance to play d5 in response and get a pass d pawn. Um, so if they play e5, you're not as averse to trading for their e pawn because it leaves you with the only center pawn. Um, so when they play e5, you're more likely to see white. Sorry, when they play e5, you're more likely to see white leaving the tension. Um, but when they play c5. And the main thing that white wants to do is to not just let this pawn trade for your d pawn and create this pawn structure because this pawn structure is pretty pretty comfortable and playable for black. So um, when they play c5, you'll usually see white play some kind of forcing move like e5 or d5, as is the case here. Black gains space with c4 and then plays queen c7. So um, if you don't know anything about this opening, it'll be a little bit harder for you to memorize these early moves than it is for me. Um, for me, I can sort of memorize the early moves of this game by default since I kind of know the opening a little bit. Um, you know, white, white has the option of taking on e6 and trying to harass this pawn on e6 with a move, you know, with some move like this or knight d4 and try and get something concrete. But if white doesn't have an immediate way to attack this or some immediate idea with e5 and queen h5 check or something, then trading on e6 does not actually weaken black as much as you might think. This pawn structure can actually be quite nice for black despite the isolated pawn. Why? Well, the isolated pawn is not on an open file, so it's not as easy to attack, and it controls the two outpost points that white might like to use. Meanwhile, black has this nice pawn majority here. So actually, like imagine the other option for having competing pawn majorities would be for this pawn to be on f7, right? In this position, it's actually often easier for white to push forward his pawn majority and show his advantage in the center, right? He can use d5 or f5 as outposts. He can play f4, he can play e5, kind of taking more space very easily. But here, this pawn on e6 actually pro provides a little more central influence for black to contain white's majority while black's majority becomes strong. And actually, I myself have like, you know, experienced the structure in my own games, which again helps me to remember it. But, um, you know, black can actually have very nice play in this kind of structure, um, especially because he has chances often to limit these two pieces from getting active. So DE6 isn't like an immediate huge threat. It's something that could happen, but um, but you'll often see this tension left here for a little bit because it's not actually a clear threat. So now white plays knight to d4, which is increasing the pressure on e6. So black's going to match that by defending e6 with knight c5. Um, and now white wanting to win the fight for the pressure on e6 continues very logically with b4. And, you know, from here you can really see how like every move is really interconnected with the previous move, which to my mind, helps us to remember this game. Um, to me, it's all very logical. White puts pressure on e6, black defends it. White tries to chase away the knight that's defending e6. Black obviously doesn't want to move that knight away, takes en passant. How does white recapture? Well, he wants to chase away this knight, right? So bishop b3 um, wouldn't do it. Actually, I guess bishop b3 does put pressure on these squares. It's definitely not what white played. What white played is ab3 to bring the pawn here and chase this knight. But maybe let's look at this move for one second and just see why it might be good or bad. Um, how about knight takes bishop, opening up queen c3. 
that should help everyone. Oh, there is queen b3. Hmm. Why is this bad move bad? Um, might not even be that bad. Hmm. You know, this move is not instantly losing. It's actually a conceivable move. Um, so I'm not going to refute it for you guys. I'm just going to continue along with the game and tell you that white goes for b4. And, uh, you know, he goes for it once, black takes on passant, and he just takes back, intending to play it again next move. And so here, um, black prevents white from playing b4 by playing it himself. Now this knight has to move. And what square are we fighting for? This one. And how can we now use this knight to fight for that square? A4. Um, now, to me, this this whole idea of b4 and knight a4 doesn't look great for white. And um, that's because black is able to move the knight away and leave this knight on a4, which to me, when you move to the side and they move to the center, um, it feels like a bad sort of trade of moves and ideas. Um, but be that as it may, let's certainly say that this move is not illogical, right? I mean, white was going for chasing this knight away. This b5 pawn is stopping knight a4. Once black plays b4 to stop white from playing b4, white then plays knight a4, attacking c5. And the idea is just to take on c5 and then take on e6. So um, this kind of forces black's hand into knight e4. And now um, this knight is misplaced, but white's not without their own trumps. If you look at the development, um, even though white spent a little bit of time with b4 and knight a4, in terms of development, white is still a move ahead of black, um, depending how you count it, one half move or one and a half moves, because they've each developed three pieces, two knights and a bishop. White's castled, where black has played queen c7, but white also has his rook on an open file or semi-open file, so it's kind of like this rook is already developed. So if you want to count this rook, white's ahead one and a half moves. The rook being developed plus the fact that it's white's move. If you don't want to count this rook for some reason, if you don't think this is legitimate um, usefulness for the rook, then you could say that white's just ahead half a move because it's white's move here, right? And that half move could go into, you know, rook to e1 or bishop b2 or whatever you like. Or in the case of this game, he plays d e6, winning back the pawn that he's just sacrificed. Um, but in any case, my point is the knight got left here, but the cost of this is that black is trading off all these center pawns, blowing the center open while his king is still in the middle and white is slightly ahead in development. So again, white's play, although I don't super love it, it's uh, close enough to being good to be to be playable. Um, so white takes back his pawn here and, oh, sorry, normally takes back the pawn here. In this game, Kasparov traded on e4 first and i recall perhaps that that was like a novelty at the time was trading this knight off first in order to open up queen h5 and that's also how i can remember that this trade happened is because i know that in a move or two queen h5 or queen g4 are going to be themes so he trades off one piece it does give black the bishop pair but this piece just one move ago wasn't that good so he trades it and then starts to open things up on these squares. And now you can understand why he traded his bishop for the knight that was on f6. It's to open up this square and this square for his queen. So that was sort of Gary's opening idea in this game. Um, now, in this position, Kramnik hastens to develop with bishop d6. Um, easy to remember because he's now about to start his his counterattack, and that'll be quite a theme of the game. So hopefully you can remember that. And you also remember that he lets Gary take on f7. Now in this position, there's two conceivable moves. Queen takes pawn, king takes pawn. Um, king takes pawn leaves your queen on this diagonal uh, and allows you to castle by hand or has the idea of trying to castle by hand. Um... But there are some problems with this move, and so Kramnik goes for queen takes f7. Uh, the problem with this move, as far as I can tell, is 
shown this way. We check the king. Um, perhaps his best move is king g8, but if that's his best move, you can see immediately what, what, what part of the problem with king f7 was, right? But let's say instead he plays g6, chasing the queen back, and she comes somewhere like this. Okay, so what's wrong with this for black? This pawn structure looks fine. We chased the queen off. Um, the king is lifted, so hopefully we can arrange some kind of castling by hand. And our bishops are occupying great diagonals, and black looks active, and white's pieces don't, these four pieces don't yet look that impressive. So I'm not that worried about having my king on f7 for one move. But if you think about it some more, the actual problem is that I can't see any easy way for black to castle by hand in this position. If you play king g7, for one thing, there's knight e6 check winning your queen. But let's say even you moved your queen or something to be able to play king g7. When white plays bishop b2, this is actually a weak diagonal and annoying for black to try and deal with it. Um, not to mention that even if knight e6 didn't win the queen, it might still keep your king from doing your castling by hand. But as long as your king is here, you can't really develop this rook to play king g8 because white's queen will take on h7. So if this pawn is frozen and this rook is frozen and this king is frozen, then actually, even though black's position currently looks more active than white, black's not in a good position to improve that very much, right? Like rook e8 to stop queen e6, maybe bishop b2 by white. And now it's really hard for black to make further improvements with, uh, with what he has here. Uh, whereas white, obviously, there are things white can do. He can bring out this rook. He can bring out this rook. He could advance this pawn to f3 or f5. Um, and actually, this situation here is just really inconvenient, and there's no easy way to organize it. So while the idea of castling by hand feels lovely, you always have to make sure that you actually have a chance to do it, and this move queen h5 prevents it. And that is also the reason behind white trading his bishop on e4. So in the game, queen f7 is played by Kramnik. And now Gary plays a very challenging move, but also something that looks, um, that looks generally correct because in this position, if white lets black castle, um, black's basically a little bit better with the beautiful positioning of their bishops. Um, so, you know, a move like bishop b2 just doesn't pack the proper punch in a position like this. Um, you know, and even a move like rook to e1, even a move like rook to e1 allows uh, black to simply castle, leaving the knight defended. And, uh, yeah, um, he gets away scot-free. So, um, so pretty much F3 is the only really challenging move. And the idea behind F3 is again to keep black from coordinating all their pieces. So if you play a simple retreat and white plays rookie one check, um, black is unable to organize his king and rook over here. I assume the bishop e7, I haven't checked this, but I assume that it loses to knight f5. So let's quickly check that. We're threatening to take on e7, and we're threatening knight d6. Check. Check. That wins, right? So um, so black would be forced into something horrible. And then uh, we can imagine that he won't be able to coordinate his pieces that well. So f3, very challenging for black. No simple response to it. And Kramnik goes for a counterattack, which he certainly had in mind when he went queen f7 that he was going to leave this knight hanging here and try to checkmate white. Um, so Kasparov plays g3. Um, knight g3 is possible. Bishop g3 is possible. He's um, blocking the action of this bishop, avoiding the checkmate, and if the knight retreats, he still has rook to e1. Although it's not as devastating here as it was a move ago, I think, because the square is available for the king. That's something, but um, I don't know. It still feels like it still feels like it's going to be bad for Black to have this king going on. Like maybe White can do this, sacking f3, but going for queen d6 or knight g5. Yeah, if bishop f3, you know, one easy win would be. 
to take with the queen, and then knight g5. So knight e6, threatening this, and just trying to mess with the king, looks like it should be very strong for white. All right, so a cool thing to do with this game, as I was saying at first, was it looked like a crushing um, attacking win for black to me when I first looked at this game. An interesting exercise to do with this game, as I play through it for you, is to see if you can imagine where white had a better chance to defend. Okay. Um, and at the end of the game, uh, at the end of the video, I'm planning to tell you. So if you want to analyze it a little bit and figure it out for yourself, it's a super good exercise and just don't watch the end of, of the video. I'll warn you when we come to it. Okay. But as we're playing through this first time, I'm not going to tell you exactly where white has a great defense because I think it's such a good exercise. I want to leave it as an option for those of you who want to want to work on your game. So, um, okay, so here we are. Black uh, Black sacks the knight in the game by castling. And as I mentioned, taking on g3 was also an option, right? Like this uh, is also a plausible option that Kramnik could have gone for. Let's go with the game. Castles. So now white is forced to take the knight because if he doesn't, his position is bad. That's like all I have to say about it, right? It's the same thing again that I was mentioning before. If black is able to castle safely without losing any material, his bishops are strong um, and his pieces are just more active. White has no advantage anywhere. So um, this knight isn't good. So white needs to accept the knight sacrifice that Kramnik's offering. And you see how like every single move this game almost is like fairly logically linked to the previous move, right? Let's go back through this short segment again for a second to, to make sure you memorize it. White takes on f7, recaptures with the queen, not the king because of queen h5. Plays f3. He's, you know, he's got to punish black for this open center with the king still in the center while his, which he got at the cost of his knight being stuck on the side. So he goes f3. And if black retreats the knight, rookie one is crushing. So black goes for a king counter attack, threatens checkmate, and then just castle, sacrificing the knight. Uh, Kasparov takes the piece, and now he's threatening a queen trade. And a queen trade would lead to a very easily winning endgame for white. So where do you think black puts his pieces? And this is also another thing that can help you memorize games, is to sometimes, along the way, ask yourself, you know, what moves you would make or what's logical. I mean, the more you understand about what's going on, the easier it is to... Uh, whoops, sorry. I didn't want to put that in your brains. Uh, <laughs> uh, the more you think about it, the easier it is to remember what, what, what the game is about. So, um, queen h3 is the logical move for the queen, staying in touch with h2, g3 now in touch with g3 to help with this bishop g3 and also in touch with checkmate with this bishop um so now here is a moment where i'm gonna have to think one second to remember what he did because um to me this looks like a position with a few candidate moves possible Yeah, I think he brings back the knight to add a defender to the king side. Yeah. Okay, so this might be one of the trickier moves to remember. I mean, no game has, or very few games are such that there's no tricky move to remember. Um, Black brings in the queen with threats here and here. Bishop g3 is a big threat. Bishop e4 is a big threat. White answers with knight to f3. Okay, so presumably part of the point of this is to attack the bishop and the other point is to bring a defender over here and he's blocking the file because his own rook isn't available as fast as black's rook. So a rook trade here could actually be very bad for white given that black is the one with the reserve coming in. Uh, so actually trading this rook for this rook is very, very bad here. That's definitely not a good option. So, knight f3. Um, 
And now black's going to take on g3. Which is uh, you know, clearly a strong move for black. Um, if white takes it, and black takes with check, and the white king comes here, and black takes on e4, this is the justification for bishop g3. Um, there's no way to defend this piece. Which means even though black sacked two pieces, he's already got three pawns. He's winning back the second piece, and it looks like this king's pretty much checkmated. So white would have to find something pretty clever not to end up, you know, losing a rook or a queen on f3 to to stop the checkmate. So black takes on g3, and white is not able to recapture it. Um and black's next move would probably be it should be four if white did absolutely nothing. But another option for black would be rook f3, rook f3, queen h2. You know, sacking a rook but getting the king on the rung more. So let's say two plausible threats from black here after bishop takes g3. And you can see why this felt like a pretty decisive game to me when I first saw it. It looked like you know, white got forced into this f3, f takes e4 thing to justify his position, and then black just sort of like shreds him with these with these bishops and that knight sack. Um, so here, Kasparov tries the kind of defensive move I've often tried. He tries just getting the last piece out, even if it doesn't have a good square, like get it somewhere, connect to this, and... Uh, kind of pray for the best he's also stopping this rook from being added to the attack uh or added to the game not immediately attacking with this move okay so bishop g5 and this allows black to consider these two moves and kramnik takes on f3 the queen can't take because of checkmate so it's got to be the rook checks here king here and here there's a very Sweet move. Um, bishop takes e4 looks plausible, right? Winning a pawn and trying to get into g2, but this king's already on the run, and we've already got g2 covered. What, what other avenue is there to get at the white king? How else might you want to attack him in this position? Not rook f8 trading rooks, but actually the best thing would be to play bishop a6, right? Um, so black basically does that. He plays bishop c6, and the threat is bishop to b5, which, as you can see, would force white to sack the queen to stop the checkmate. And even if white took on g3, um, and black took here, this would still basically be a checkmate threat. So... Yeah. So bishop c6 going for what's essentially a checkmate. I mean, the queen can can sacrifice herself. Um, so Kasparov finally gets this knight back into play, but not in a very powerful way. He brings it back here to block this diagonal without losing the queen. Now, in this position, there's a really sweet move um, for many for many people, this might be a surprise, but to me, it's a very logical move. Um, so hopefully you can see it that way too and uh, you know, remember it yourselves. But here he's going to bring in the last attacking piece, the rook on e8. And we're looking at a situation here where let's say you just calculated some of your direct options to try and checkmate the opponent. You're able to chase him a little bit, but you're not able to catch him, right? Very often in positions like this, once you sort of get a king on the run, the first thing you want to do is break into his castle and get him on the run. But the second thing you want to do is not to keep chasing him because he'll move towards where his other pieces are, right? Right now, he's kind of bereft of helpers a little bit. So very often, the first thing you do is you kind of break up his castle and get him on the run. The second thing you do is cut him off instead of chasing. And in general, in any... um king chase kind of situation um, or any king hunt always consider both chasing and cutting off 
Okay. Sometimes it's best to check, check, and you have to calculate that every time because for all you know, he might just be, you know, checkmated straight into his own pieces, right? Just get blocked by them. You can chase or you can cut off. You always have to consider both. So what does black play here? Well, a move beautiful for its simplicity just develops this rook to this file preparing to cut the king off. And now let's see if we can come up with a threat for black, right? Like let's say I play as white. I need a way to pass a move. I don't really see one. Maybe this move does nothing. Let's just see what black's threat is. Check here. Check here. And it looks like he sort of gets away, right? Let's try again. What about rook e4 as our move? Right? Always want to try the checking and the cutting off. Rook e4 is our move. Um, that threatens made in one. Mm. Mm. Looks tricky for white to stop, right? If you play this move, there's checkmate. Play this move. Check here. Check. And now he's finally got so many pieces blocking him that he can't escape. And this is a checkmate off of a double, whoops, sorry, off of a double pin. So it looks very clear that um, black has a nice threat to, uh, to cut white off. And now I'm also remembering that black has a second threat, maybe, that's a little bit more surprising. I've, I recall that in some position, black has the threat to surprisingly trade off the knight. Well, that may be here. Let's just see what happens. Um, so Kasparov is really low on defenses here. And in fact, he's in a losing position. Plays rook a2. And that covers some of these squares or checkmates. It does lose the rook, um, which Kramnik doesn't take. But the idea would be to then recapture here. And white can struggle on for a little while, although I think they're still losing pretty clearly. All right, but in this position, I think Kramnik misses a very short checkmate with bishop takes d3. If the rook takes, well, let's see. First of all, if the queen takes, check here, checkmate. The rook can now take because this rook is covering f2. Then I think he can check, force the king up, check, force the king up, and checkmate like that. Right, so that's the moment where Kramnik misses the checkmate, is right after this rook a2 decoying move. Um, so what Kramnik does do here is he chases the white king, right? If he doesn't play this and he doesn't play this, there's only one other, whoops, one other logical move, and it's queen d2 for surprise value. Um, there's only one other logical move here since his queen's attacked. He's got to, uh, he's pretty much got to take the rook or check. So queen h1 check, king here. Now he gets this pawn with check. Um, this bishop can't block because queen g2 will be checkmate again. So the king has to keep running. Now he checks him again. And what he's done is he's chased this king from here over to c1 because he is planning to take this rook. And now the king is much more exposed over here once you're deciding to, you know, that you agree to take the rook on a2. Send him way over here. Now black's up three pawns, so Kasparov takes the bishop. And uh, Kramnik wins the game by sort of attacking the king and the knight. So the most effective way to do that is transfer.
for your queen to c3 with check where it'll be helping to attack that knight wow lots of weird lots of weird moves coming out of misclicks today right checks him here checks him over there king over here i mean i forget for sure whether casper resigns here on the next move um but again it doesn't really matter his only legal move is this he either resigned or he played that move allowing rook to d4 and then here would be a good um place to resign as well so i think this is where kasparov resigned he can't defend the knight so he's going to be down three pawns and also checkmated um if you play around with this position a little bit because you care for some reason you will quickly ascertain that uh there are some quick checkmates for black here and uh they're fun too because uh there's basically this threat like if white played bishop f6 for example I think I remember that the threat, the way for black to crash through here is to play bishop to b1. Um, and that kind of gives you a cool check by opening this up and rook d2. So rook d4 and he resigns. All right. Um, now, I promised that I would suggest one or two defenses for white at the end. Um, and I left it till the end so that you could stop watching the video and cover your ears if you don't want to know where white could have defended better. Okay, so I'll say once this happened, white is on the run and pretty much dead. So if you were looking for defenses for white after this point, you uh, should work on your sense of when you're dead. Um, this is a position that's completely completely deathly for white at this point so we're gonna have to go back further all right so to me this is a logical point to look at because the move bishop g5 doesn't have the hugest impact right this bishop never defended an important square and this rook never came across on the first rank so this is a suspicious looking move so if we go here on um, what would be a logical move for white instead of bishop g5? Well, he needs to bring reserve defenders to his king, right? If you've watched my my series on reserves in attack and defense, um, you'll definitely know what I'm talking about because this little example here could well have gone into that series. Um, you've got to defend what squares? Like maybe e4, f3, h3, g2, sorry, h2, g2, these four squares maybe. So how do rooks and queens work as defenders well the queen moves like the rook so she has some similarity to the rook and the answer is for both of these pieces but especially for the rook you got to get in front okay so even if this first row were cleared this rook would not be doing like fantastic defensive work on the first row right as in the game bishop g5 it doesn't really matter for this rook it doesn't do too much but if you move it to the second row it can a, defend two of the four squares we're talking about. B, block, in many cases, a direct check from like a queen or a rook. Okay, so the defensive moves in this position that make sense are queen e2 and rook a2. And I guess, like in some case, queen c2, like should also make your candidate list. It's similarly just on the second row from e2, she and c2, she defends one or two different squares, but a lot of the same squares um the problem with this one here well there's a couple problems but it loses contact with these two and it also allows the opponent to bring out this rook with tempo in some case so i'm sure queen c2 is simply like worse than queen e2 here um so the two defensive moves to consider here queen e2 and rook to a2 all right now if we back up another move I think we have another important moment here. You can also guess this based on which moves were like super forced during this game and which moves it felt like, you know, the player had some kind of an option. In this position where knight f3 was played, definitely the move knight f5 looks like another candidate move to me. Um, or queen e2 or rook to a2 again. So let's try, let's just try one of these moves really briefly just to put them on the board and, and, and see what it kind of looks like. If knight f5, he 
you might you have to calculate this move and this might not really work so now they're threatening checkmate and they're threatening the knight um so now let's try queen e2 is there a way to deflect the queen and win this? I'm very worried about this move versus using an, a new piece. But they can't yet take on h2. They could try taking on e4 anyway here. That is possible. Um, They could try bishop g3, but now I would block this file. I have this defended, I have this defended. So that's you know some kind of a plausible variation. Yeah. So queen e2 looks like a conceivable move, and rook a2 looks like a conceivable move. Defending this, if they sack on g3, again, you could block with your rook after actually taking it. Um, you know, in some case, you could play rook f2 here to actually trade off the rooks. So there you have it. Two better defensive moves. Uh, two moves in a row, right? And similar moves, right? Wasn't it this each time? I think it was. So there's a couple answers for um, for the better defensive moves. They're very logical in terms of like actually using the pieces you have to actually defend your king, right? Um, so yeah, so those are the improvements uh, for white on this game. Other than that, the game is like pretty straight and logical. In my opinion, let's go back to our main line of knight f3. So we can see the whole game. Nope, that's wrong. I need the main move again here. Nope. Yes. All right, now we've got the main branch finally. Yep. All right. So, um, yeah, so play through this game a few times. To me, there's a logical thread that runs pretty much all the way through the game. Um, there's like two important moves here, knight f3 and bishop g5, where white has like a range of defensive options. And those are interesting moments to analyze, to improve your analytical skill and your defensive skill. Um, and you can definitely draw lessons from them. Like I've already told you, you know, that this is like how you use reserves is, um, is a good lesson from it. And other than those two key moments, everything else is pretty... Is pretty memorable. So um, good luck with that one. That that if you get there, that brings you up from about 25 moves in our in our fourth video to 35 moves in our fifth video. Um, as I'd said, you kind of need to go, you may need to go like two moves at a time instead of 10 moves at a time, in which case you need to pick out um, some games for yourself that are you know 27, 29, 30, 32 moves long, and so forth. But um uh, this, you know is a good is a good choice for a for a fun game to learn and uh even though black's play is not as crushing as i first thought it was the game remained very memorable to me because black's play was flashy and conclusive and looked so looked so correct so yeah so that's that's today's game um i hope you'll enjoy it um also shows that even players like kasparov and kramnik make mistakes um even you know in a situation that's very like tactical and it's like okay you got to play the right defensive move and you've got three candidate moves and you're casper off the best player in history maybe at the time certainly um and you can still pick the wrong move so um yeah that's uh that's a game that apparently has stuck with me for you know five months or so after i learned it and uh hopefully it'll you know, stick in your mind and accompany you on your path as well. All right, that's all for now. Take care. Bye.